And I will establish my covenant with you. Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee and make thy name great. And the Lord thy God will bring thee into the land which thy fathers possessed. And I will put my law in their minds and write it in their hearts. Shalom, hello again, and welcome to our new series on the covenants of God. This is a fascinating Bible study, and Bible study is what Christian people are supposed to be occupied with. You know, there's a chapter in 2 Timothy, chapter 2, uh, my Schofield Bible heads it up, the path of a good soldier in the time of apostasy. Paul is uh, advising or, uh, how to uh, uh, study the Bible, and in verse 15 he says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That's an interesting thought, dividing the word of truth. The Bible is a huge book, and we do have to divide it into sections. It's already divided as to authors and as to chapters, even uh, the way the English Bible is. And uh, in this manner, we cut the job up into parts, and we study the parts and so on in order to master the whole thing. That's all very well. There have been different ways to divide the Bible, though, and some are not really correct. Uh, the division of Old Testament, New Testament, everybody takes for granted is not really a very good way of dividing the Word of God. That is, the Old Testament is not old. It has prophecy about the kingdom in it, for heaven's sake. Uh, it hasn't even happened yet. Uh, the New Testament has not superseded it. It's simply, uh, well, they say the old is in the new con revealed, the new is in the old concealed. Uh, they work together. It's really one book. Some people have called it the Jewish uh, and the Gentile Bible. Well, that's nuts. I mean, the whole Bible is a Jewish Bible. The New Testament is all written by Jewish writers in Israel, sometimes written in Greek to Greek cities and so forth, but by Jewish apostles. All of the Bible writers are Jews. If you have a problem with Luke being a Gentile, write to us for our study on that. But I can assure you it's entirely a Jewish Bible. Uh, some people have uh, divided it into the former and the latter Bible as if the first part of it is to be discarded now. Goodness, uh, the Roman Catholic Church, uh, other large denominations pay little attention to the Old Testament uh, because it's, uh, it's, it's for past times, for ancient people. Well, that's, again, uh, the thing is full of uh, a brand new prophecy. 1 Corinthians 10.11 tells us that the things that happened to the people of old times are for example examples to us upon whom the ends of the age are come. So if, if what happened to David and Abraham and Noah and Adam are, are for lessons for us, well, then we've got to read those lessons, and we, we've got to keep that, that Bible. It's not former, and it's not outmoded. Neither is the New Testament latter. It's, it's, it's a later uh, writing, but it is the same God saying the same thing. God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. The most successful way I've ever found to divide the Word of God is into the eight covenants that God made with men. He made a lot of different agreements, but there are eight major covenants that are clear signposts of different spiritual economies He made with men, pretty much according to how men behaved. Uh, he gave us eight ways to relate to Him, you might say. Those eight covenants are as follows. There's a covenant called the Edenic, about the Garden of Eden, a very simple one. Uh, a man was to live in the garden, till the place, and not eat of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Uh, there's the Adamic covenant, the one made with Adam. Sin and death had entered the world because man had used his free will and did eat of that tree, and now uh, we had problems. And so the Adamic covenant has several parts. We're going to review all these in detail. Uh, then we come to the Noahic covenant. There came a point when God established human government through just one family. He had, had the flood, and he got rid of all but Noah's family. It, it's a little bit like... 
when management is negotiating with the union and, and finally says to them, look, you run this plant, we give it up. You think you know how to run, you run it. Uh, in a sense, God said to men, I, I, I have uh, tried to be your righteous God and, and asked you to come to me, but you're running the place crazy, really and truly. And uh, so we come to uh, Noah and the flood. And so there's a covenant for human government, for, for men to run the world, called the Noahic Covenant. Those are the three early covenants. Then we come to the covenants with Israel, the Abrahamic Covenant, first off. Uh, we're living under these covenants now. That one is very effective, where he told Abraham, get up and go into the land I'll show thee. And that land he gave to Abraham, seed the Jewish people through Isaac and Jacob forever. We're not only living with it, we're reading about it every day because the land is being cut up and given away uh, with blessings of, of, of even our own government. Um, and, and the Abrahamic covenant, however, gave all of it and more besides to the Jewish people. <clears throat> the covenant with Moses came, the law. Uh, rather than human government, here's a law for a single people, uh, the Jewish people, to behave in order to relate to God. Uh, then came the land covenant. The conditional covenant, if they obeyed the Lord, they could live in the land, but if they disobeyed the Lord, then they'd be dispersed out of the land and they would live in all other lands and run from place to place and so on. And uh, unfortunately, that is the option they took and we saw the dispersions and now <coughs> we are living in the age of the restoration of the Jews to the promised land. Then the covenant with King David. Uh, that there would always be a, a member of his family to be king over Israel. Once David became king, then his son Solomon and his son and his son all the way down. And you may say, well, where's the Davidic king today? And I say, well, he's on the throne. It's, it's the king of the Jews, Jesus. Uh, he is in heaven, but he will come back to earth and occupy his worldly throne. He would have simply occupied the throne had they received the kingdom when he came, but instead... Uh, we have the church age, the parenthetical period, he will return and he will occupy the throne of David at that time. But in any case, there has always been a ruler of David's family. Finally, we come to the last covenant, the new covenant, the one where God says, I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. I'll write my law on their hearts. Uh, they'll all know me. Uh, this, uh, everyone uh, claims, is the Christian covenant. It is the Christian covenant, so to say, but it is made with Israel and with Judah. Jeremiah 31, 31 says, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Hebrews 8, 8 says the same thing. It uh, then is inherited by all of those who believe the Jewish Messiah and are willing to uh, accept the uh, terms of this covenant. <coughs> and there, sin is forgiven. God remembers it no more. You know, a good Bible teacher said to me one time, I'll never say to God, uh, I won't do that anymore, God, because he'll say, do what again? I don't remember. And uh, uh, this, is, this is the new covenant in effect, and it's the one under which believers in the Jewish Messiah uh, are living. Now, as I say, all the covenants from Abraham on have been made with Israel. Israel is very important in this study, so I'm going to be stressing it. No surprise there, I suppose. Now, to talk about the individual covenants, you know, that first one, the covenant of the Garden of Eden, it really didn't have much in it. I mean, all Adam had to do was take care of that garden, avoid that tree, uh, Maybe tell his wife not to talk to serpents. I don't know, but uh, there, wasn't, there wasn't a whole lot to the covenant, but there is a whole lot to creation. What made the garden, what made the earth, what made the world, those six days, what we read in uh, Genesis 1, is one of the most amazing and fascinating passages in the entire Scripture. In rightly dividing the Word of God, I would say there needs to be a division right there while we consider how we ever got here, how God made the plants and the animals and the men and the garden of Eden. And for that purpose, we spoke to a scientist, Dr. Gerald Schroeder, a nuclear physicist, a professor who graduated with a PhD from MIT. And he wrote the books Genesis and the Big Bang and God and Science, uh, these two very deep and fascinating books in which he explains his theory of origins. I thought a good place to talk to Professor Schroeder about these ancient things would be in front of the ancient walls of Jerusalem.
the six days of Genesis are 24 hours each as measured by a watch as we would see it. And they are made of hours and seconds as we know them, but they include all the ages of the universe as we see the ages of the universe. The wonder. The beauty. The soul of the Holy Land. Come with Zola on his next tour to Israel. I spoke to Professor Schroeder outside the Jaffa Gate. In his book, Genesis and the Big Bang, he explains how creation of the Earth might very well have happened 15 billion years ago. Sure, I think so. The Bible, the Bible has a view of time that sees six 24-hour days go by, from the creation of the universe to the creation of the soul of Adam. We look as scientists and see 15 billion years, but there's a difference in how we see time. We live today and we look back in time. We get information either from fossils or out into, out into space, and we, and we, from our 1997 or present view of time, are looking back in time. The Talmud, 1,500 years ago. Now, the Talmud is a Jewish commentary. It's a commentary on the, on, on, the, on the five books of Moses. Yeah, it's a straight, it's, it's probably one of the oldest of commentaries written on. It's, it was written down 1,500 years ago. So it's long before science. So there's no attempt of saying, well, it was trying to bend the Bible to match science. No one knew science 1,500 years ago. <laughs> okay. But it points out something interesting. It says that the Bible sees time looking forward from the beginning. And it learns that from the fact that how the days are numbered. The days are numbered one by one. There's evening and morning day one, evening and morning a second day, third day, fourth day. This is a change, Zola, from one to second to third, from, from the absolute value of one to the comparative, second, third, fourth. Why day one, we're asked? Day one, day one we're asked to have so that we can see that the Bible is seeing time from the beginning, uh -huh. looking forward when there was no other time. If the Bible was seeing time, from, let's say, from Adam, well, it wouldn't have said day one, it would have said a first day, because it already had the six days. Looking with the, back, of course, yeah. looking back. But it says day one because it sees time looking forward. So you could say, so the Bible sees time looking forward, we see time looking back. So what? So what? So comes along Albert Einstein of the laws of relativity and says, you know what? Your perspective of time determines exactly how much time you'll, you'll see go by. We look back in time 15 billion years from the beginning. The Bible looks forward in time. There is evening and morning day one. And Albert Einstein and the laws of physics and the physics textbooks that are used today around the world give us the number, the ratio between seeing time looking forward seeing time looking back. And that ratio, Zola, happens to be, it's an amazing, I just lifted the number. It's not me, it's not Schroeder, it's not religion, it's straight relativistic physics that you don't have to do the calculation. It's in the textbook. The ratio between our view of time and time looking forward is a million times a million. That's the one with 12 zeros after. It means that what, what, what the Bible would see as a day looking forward, we would see as a million, million days looking back. What the Bible sees as six days looking forward we see as six million million days looking back. Well, Zola, six million million days divided comes out to happen, happens to be 15 billion years. The Bible sees six days, we would see those six days as six million million days. Divide that by 365, and you get 15 and three quarter billion years, exactly the estimate of the age of the universe today. <laughs> okay, let me try to restate what you said. Uh, from our perspective, we, those six days that we read about there, looking back, really, uh, because of our frame of reference, comes out to be the amount of time needed that is to satisfy the scientists who are calculating the age of the Earth or of the universe from the Big Bang straight on to where we are. You explain in your book about frames of reference that, that if I take a clock somewhere else in the universe, 
it's going to run at a different speed. There are different forces on it. There's different gravity and so forth. And uh, that God, from his perspective, has a clock that is running. Uh, well, let's say we were sitting right beside God. Would, would we have perceived 15 billion years as he worked? No, you've hit it exactly on the point. You perceive six 24-hour days. The, I make it very clear the days are 20, the six days of Genesis are 24 hours each as measured by a watch as we would see it. And they are made of hours and seconds as we know them but they include all the ages of the universe as we see the ages of the universe. And so when I read a text, when I do my calculations and I publish a paper and say, well, the universe is 15 and a half or so billion years old, there's a second half of the sentence I never bother saying. The universe is 15 and a half billion years old from our space-time reference point. Every cosmologist knows this. You just don't bother saying it. And the moment you change reference points, the, anything is up for grabs. And the Bible gives us the reference looking forward from the beginning and the numbers are there. The ratio of time is in physics textbooks literally around the world, reviewed literature. So we don't need these arguments about uh, God is an antique maker or he salted the earth with fossils to test our faith. Or uh, There was time enough for there all time this to happen. Look, you can, oh, there is, as I mentioned in the Genesis of the Big Bang and also in my new book, The Science of God, the, that God may have put the fossils in the ground to make the world look old, it's an argument that you can't disprove. Yeah. But you don't need that argument. You can, it may be true, I always say it may be true, but I don't accept that it's necessarily true because once we understand the laws of, of the flow of time, the time is there. In six 24-hour days are all the ages of the universe. And those, that, that's the fact. It's an amazing world we live in. Well, what a fascinating man to talk to, really. Uh, you know, it's exciting to think that a scientist is convinced that six days and nights, as Genesis gives it, can be 15 and three-quarter billion years also, depending on your point of view in the universe. It's a concept that that is, it's easy to escape us, and we're going to have uh, Gerald back some more. We're going to ask some more questions, so if you were a little foggy, I was too, to tell you the truth. But his books are out there, Genesis and the Big Bang and God and Science, his new book, and uh, these are very valuable. Uh, you could sit over the book and ponder exactly what he meant. You know, I brought up evolution as part of our talk to, and he didn't favor it. Uh, he began by uh, showing me a fascinating and significant fossil. This is a trilobite. It's the first of the insects. I'd hate to see that on my kitchen floor. Yeah, well, you might. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an old, it's 500 million years old, which puts it right smack dab in the middle of day five. 24-hour uh -huh. day five. I make that clear. I always emphasize it. Okay. Smack dab in the middle. It's the Cambrian explosion. Now, the trilobite is the first of the insects. Along with the trilobite were sponges and mollusks, crabs and, and worms and chordata and etc. All, all the basic body plans. Now this trilobite is not perfect. It's been reconstructed. It was bitten off. Uh -huh. yeah. 500 million years ago, they were mouths. You understand? It was bitten off. Yes. But one of the eyes remains. Yes. Now the eye in this is not a perfect fossil, the perfect ones are in the, in the museums. The perfect fossils, you can actually test the curvature of the multiple lenses of the insect eye. They're optically perfect. Uh -huh. What this means is in the fossil record below this, older than this, earlier than, earlier than that, early, in, early to the beginning of day five, or once on day four and going back to day three where life first appears, are one-celled creatures, bacteria, algae, the stuff that makes water green, protozoans, the things you see in high school under a microscope that has a little circle with little hair coming out, it swims across the field. One-celled creatures, and then explodes into life things like this trilobite, with eyes, with jointed limbs, with intestines, with gills. From where? From algae? A sudden jump. From bacteria? <laughs> yeah. If one, an explosion. That, that Darwin never thought that this, it was even, even into the, well into the 1900s, 1950s, 1960s, it was thought that, okay, we knew about these, but we find other fossils leading up to it earlier. No, what's been found earlier than this remains all the same, one-celled life. It's a question that, as I say, the real problem with, with evolution is the fossil record, it's not the Bible. The Bible says the following in days five and day six. In the whole six sentences, that's all it gives is six sentences of evolution. First comes aquatic animals, then comes land animals, then comes mammals, then comes people. That's the origin in the 
in the Bible. Okay. That's the origin of the fossil, that's the order in the fossil record as well. The difficulty is how you go from one to the other. And randomness doesn't work. Random reactions don't seem possible to have done it. The laws of nature must be somehow, even from a secular point of view, from a secular point of view, the laws of nature have shown life to be channeled, directed. Gerald, do you really believe in your heart of hearts then that you have uncovered <laughs> the secret of creation in six days? I, it, to me, so it was so, it's, it's so obvious. I mean, the, the two views of time, the laws of relativity, if you've worked in physics, it just, I mean, it just leaps out of, off the page at you. But I am pleased about having finally seen how the each day maps. And that, that I bring in the science of God, the, uh, the new book. The next. That now understanding finally the exact relationship, we can see how long each day is. They're not of equal length. They get exponentially shorter, starting with 8 billion years, 4 billion to 1. The numbers flow exactly from the physics textbooks. They're not my numbers. That's what's so beautiful. And when you look at the biblical description of what the Bible says happens on each day, and you compare it to cosmology, paleontology, the fossil record, finally archaeology, it matches day by day. I'm not bending the data, Zola. I promise you, the match is phenomenal. I don't know if I've discovered something. I think maybe I just put, I stumbled onto something. I like think that. you've discovered something people have been thinking about from since the seventh day when... <laughs> 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 what about that? Just that in closing, there is this seventh day. It says God rested. You discussed this word rest in Genesis and the Big Bang. Yeah. God, God pulls back and allows nature in itself to start operating in a way that we understand it. Using our time, using our frame reference, when the soul of Adam is created, we now flow with time as we know it, the seventh day is a day as we know it, and God allows man to go forward using his free will or her free will and uh, make the choices good or bad. Sometimes they're bad and sometimes they're good. There's no more six days equals 15 billion years, but a day is a day and a, a month is a month yeah. as we know them. Yeah, and God is still present. You can see that. I mean, Adam and Eve eat from the fruit. They're kicked out of Eden. Cain kills, murders Abel. Cain is, exa, is, is sent away. So God's still active, but allowing man to make his choices. I mean, God could have stopped Cain from killing Abel, yes. but doesn't, yes. doesn't. So we, can, we make our choices now. That doesn't mean you're, we're free agents, but we, have, but we do operate now with our, own, with our free will. You know, there were all sorts of covenants made in the ancient world, and there are in the modern world. Uh, people make agreements, contracts, and so on. Uh, blood was often a part of it uh, when God made the covenant with Abraham or with Noah. Animals were divided. They walked through the blood and so forth. The American Indians, uh, in an example closer to our own time, used to cut the palms of their hands and put their hands together and mix their blood to show how in agreement they were that their blood actually mixed together. And when the Indian greeted someone, he would raise his hand 
saying how or something, but he would show his hand and any scar on his hand uh, showing that he had a covenant was revealed. And uh, it, it, this is actually alluded to in scripture. It was done also in ancient days. Uh, Isaiah 52 10 says this, uh, the Lord hath made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. Or uh, Isaiah 53, 1, who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? You know, some people raise their arms when they worship in this manner. Uh, they may not realize it, but they are doing the ancient sign of showing uh, that they have a covenant, and they do have a covenant. Uh, the scars aren't there because they didn't have to cut their hands before God, but you know, God is in heaven and the only man-made thing in heaven is the scars in Jesus' hands, uh, which were made to deliver us from sin. Well, we're going to go on with the covenants. Uh, that was the uh, Edenic covenant, and next week we'll take up the Adamic and Noahic covenants. And on each program, we'll have some expert on the covenant to uh, give us some more special knowledge of it. Our offer this week is about the Old Testament. And, you know, I, I often uh, uh, get on a soapbox about this. Some churches just don't teach the Old Testament. Huge denominations uh, don't teach it. Uh, the the uh, it, that's a wrong thing. It, it's seventy five percent of God's word. It's uh, most of prophecy, including virtually all of the prophecies of the kingdom. If you'd like to know, uh, you know what's going to happen in the kingdom, you have to read Isaiah. You can't read it in the New Testament. Uh, to read one without the other. I don't know, I heard somebody say once, like having a, a telephone book and tearing out all of the pages up to about the letter R and trying to get <laughs> the, the rest of the letters to tell you what you need to know. Uh, we need the whole Bible. And so uh, we prepared some time ago, Dr. McCall, the senior theologian of this ministry, and myself, a book called The Bible Jesus Read. We should realize that the Old Testament was Jesus' Bible. It's what he read every day and how he ordered his own life. When I gave the scriptures uh, about dividing the Word of God, it also says all scripture is for doctrine and correction and reproof. When it says all scripture there in the New Testament, it means the Old Testament. That was originally a letter. Uh, when he wrote all scripture in that letter, the apostle was saying, the Old Testament is good for doctrine, correction, and reproof. So get this book, The Bible Jesus Read, $10 at our uh, post office box or uh, by credit card at our 800 number. Uh, I think it's a good read and it'll tell you all about these covenants. All of the covenants are in the Old Testament. And then our Levitt letter and our catalog are free for the asking. Just give us your name and address. We'll be glad to send you either one of those. And remember, Sha'alu Shalom, Yerushalayim. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem.